So how we're going to do this is we've got um, two or three questions that we're going to speak through as a panel, and then hopefully at the end there'll be time for some questions from the audience. So the first question I have for our panel is, why does a sustainable regenerative approach to activism matter to you personally? So, well, I, everyone's looking at that one, so it looks as if you're going to start. Um, for me, I guess, I'm, first of all, I'm coming off uh, here off the back of a vacation, which I think is the perfect way uh, to prepare for this. And it's given me a week to think about um, today and what we'll be discussing, and also just to reflect on the last few years uh, of being in this space. Um, so I think it makes sense to explain my background a little bit and then answer the question. Um, so I am... Um, a climate activist, um, but I'm a campaigner with Avaz, which is an organization that works on a bunch of different issues. Um, and prior to joining Avaz, I joined the climate movement at 18 by turning up at my first COP, um, which I'm sure will come up through that throughout the day because COPs tend to be a source of burnout for a lot of activists. Um, and I was working um, in an unsustainable way and got used to seasons of burnout where I would work towards the end of the year and then no one would see me from January to April. And that was my burnout period. And I prepared for it every year um, and I thought that that was the life I was committing to. If this was my mission, um, you know, I would have burnout seasons and I'd have manic seasons where I would run and give all my energy. Um, Fast forward a few years, I went through university and you know that did that every year and joined Avaz. Um, and Avaz has now listening actually just to um, the wonderful um, person from ULIC speaking, so much of the components of the regenerative space. Um, and I think what it gave me and why it's important to me is it gave me the language and the vernacular of like sustainability and understanding you know these feelings of burnout or um, these burdens of activism that I was facing but couldn't vocalize um, and I think that's like one of the key components and gifts that I think we could take away from this is becoming comfortable with the language um, and the reason it's important to me is that Activism isn't something I do for work. It's, it's my life mission. So it's something that I know and I have grounded myself in that I'm going to be committed to uh, for a lifelong. Whether I'm working for a vase or I'm doing something else, this is going to be my life. I then need to find a way to sustain that throughout my life, lifetime. Um, and that I don't have these seasons, that I have a full life. Um, and there's a lot of different ways that I've uh, found that I've been able to do that. But I don't know if this is the right time to start talking, speaking to that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so for me, I think the key thing was recognizing what burnout is. Um, and I didn't. Um, and it's interesting, I was speaking to someone just as I walked in, and they were like, I haven't seen you since 2015. You were kind of like, uh. I was like, yeah. <laughs> Looking back in hindsight, I was going through a large period of burnout. And the reason, the, the moment I realized was I went to um, a staff away week where the topic of the week was inspiration. Finding your pipeline, finding your inspiration. And for the first time in my life, I experienced social anxiety because I couldn't connect with the people in the room. I was like, what is this inspiration they're feeling? What is it? Like, I don't know what it is that you're talking about. I'm not feeling inspired. I've not felt inspired for months. Um, and I, I couldn't connect with them, and I couldn't connect with this idea of inspiration. Um, and that's when I realized that this wasn't my norm, that I was so used to identifying burnout with being tired where I'd be like, oh, I'll sleep for a few weeks, I'm gonna get sick, I'm gonna be fine. But that burnout could be this depletion of inspiration or it could be this loss of connection. Um, and through the years, I've realized that burnout isn't this single thing. It's not something that we can identify and be like, these are the things you need to, you know, this is the symptoms, you're experiencing burnout. Burnout is different for all of us. And it takes years to realize what burnout is for you, and it comes and goes, um, and it's realizing that 
a bad day and burnout are not the same thing. Um, and I think that's the first step. Once you identify what burnout is for you, you can then build the tools um, uh, to try it and work with it and avoid it or you know, accept and welcome it when, it, uh, when it's present. Thanks so much, Fatima. There's some really valuable stuff in there, particularly the point about this being a life path for many of us, not a thing you kind of do and then separate from, and how do you do that in a regenerative way, and uh, rather than having this kind of peak and troughs that so many of us are familiar with. And also this, this um, question of symptoms and understanding what it is and what it is for you. So thank you. Sophie. Thank you. Um. is to change something out there but then we recreate it and we don't recognize it in our groups mm -hmm. and for me that's not a, an irritating side issue to me that's absolutely central so the, the first layer is is we're repeating the same patterns we're creating unsustainable practices we're creating division and conflict and this and the sort of deeper layer for me is we don't if we don't notice that and pay attention to it and respond we're creating the pattern which I think is the biggest problem out there, which is that we don't reflect on, on the dysfunction. You know, we don't reflect on the pain, we don't reflect on the separation, we don't reflect on our lack of joy, on the, our pain in response to what we see and the suffering that we see around us. So there's the patterns themselves that we're repeating, which tells me that we haven't really understood what it is we're trying to heal, and this kind of you know, the pattern of looking at the patterns and making meaning out of the, out of the pain. So if we're not doing that, kind of, you know, the question for me is, what are we doing? What are we doing? Um, and, and all of that, for me, comes as a teaching to us, you know, uh, to, to learn more deeply what, what our purpose is to, to be, to deepen into the inquiry of what is transition about, you know, what is sustainability, sustainability about all. What is anti-oppression more for that? So. That's great. Thanks, Sophie. That's very insightful, and it's, it really is this question about using dysfunctional patterns and practices to try and fix things, and, and that doesn't work. There's an essential problem with that, and going to a deeper way of looking at things in alternative ways and really examining what that is that you've really pinpointed. Sad. Mean as a, as a lifelong commitment, and how do you sustain yourself? 
And I, for me, it's always been more of a reflective question. Um, so I was really struck by some of the points that Jean was saying, because to me, you know, that a lot of these, a lot of this discussion uh, has put words to things that we were, were intrinsic or part of community resistance, but never, you could never put a word to it, right? So, you know, I, I, in the late 70s and early 80s, around racist violence and police murders, and, and you know, uh, how does a community deal with the fact that it's burying people, right? And you're at funerals and you're at, you know, and you see huge injustice, people being killed and no justice for it, with people dying at the, at the hands of the police. And, and I, I was always struck that, you know, a lot of that resilience came from what the community was doing, that it had spaces, right, for that sharing of pain and recognising that there was a sharing of pain. But also it, that collective space, usually around food, where you could, where you didn't have this I, that you had this we, right? So it acknowledged that there was a space and that different people brought different things to the table. And it also recognised that this was transformative, that we were in a really long struggle. Uh, and, and I was always struck, about, struck by that. And I was or, like, uh, things that I, I suppose, when I looked at the NGO world, you know, I, and, uh, I, I recognised that weren't there, right? And this, even this recognition that where we are now, we, we're part of a longer struggle, right? When I grew up, in the, we were in the Asian youth movement. We said, you know, we're here to fight racism, but we're part of an anti-imperialist movement. We come from, because of our generations and our parents fought against colonialism. It put us in a pathway, and it recognised that the fight we were in now was part of a much, much bigger fight. And, and, the de and victories and defeat were these moments of where we were, not that, you know, you had to throw yourself. Um, those of a certain age probably remember the sort of the also the, of course in the eighties we had Thatcher, and I was struck then being active also in left groups. You know this sense of you know one more push, right? One more push, and everything will be all right. And if you, and you had to live and breathe, and you, you had to be at everything because you know if you weren't there, you know, you know we could you, you know your simply your presence would help us be able to win and of course there was deeply traumatic moments right? we, those of you involved with the minor strike is, for example in 1984 would say how did we lose right how did the state win and look at what the implications were for communities in terms of that destruction and i think it turned a lot of people into this either very very sectarian because people then went into very very sort of narrow spaces and started to despair at changing the world and then have this holier-than-thou attitude to each other, right? That the way to prove how political you were was about how much you did, not what you did, and then use that as a barometer against each other rather than saying, well, actually, in the balance of forces, we have to recognize we're weak. We have to build something different. And I've always been interested in that, how are we building our power and who needs to be part of that power? And, and I suppose I've been very fortunate. I've worked, been able to work with global movements. And there's so much more that the global movements have to teach us in terms of that sustainable level of activism, what that we actually means, what your space is within that, and, you know, and how communities build that regenerative and sustainable activism in the, in the long run. So for me, it was more, you know, I, I've been interested in this from a, you know, what does what does our radical black politics in our communities bring to this? Because a lot of this is, of course, stuff our communities have learned through the hard way, right? Because they've fought hundreds of years against things and, uh, and they have steadfastness. And sometimes I think that's, not, that's lacking within the movements. Now, within the UK, we think everything has to have an instant success. Thanks, I said, yeah, again, really powerful locating what we do in the wider historical trajectory and a sense of the real pain and the real loss that it, it's not just a theoretical thing, this is actually life and death. And how do you locate yourself within that without, without getting overwhelmed and connecting to community? So that's brilliant. Um, I'm gonna go this way around now. <laughs> uh, so what do you see as the main challenges or obstacles to a more sustainable or regenerative practice, both at individual and organizational level? So let, let, let me say something maybe about organizational then. And I think I, I, I'm an executive director of an organization, War and Want. We're famous for being the most radical NGO. We believe in system change. We, we 
campaigned against neoliberalism when nobody would say the word. You know, we no problem. We've supported, you know, from the ANC to the Polisario to the Palestinians, we take the hardest issues. But when I look at that, I, I also see now being the director of all these other challenges, right, which are how do you make sure you've got money coming in? How do you pay for your staff, you know, make sure your staff are being paid? How do you make sure you, you're engaging supporters? And there's a real challenge to that, right? So, of course, in your mind, we know, you know, that we, you know, as, as we're on, we have like four principles, you know. We, we work with our partners in the global south. We, we run hard-hitting campaigns. We believe power comes collectively, so we build in alliances and you need to educate people. We say all of that, and of course we do a lot, but there are also challenges because funders want outputs now, right? They want to see things happening now, and even your supporters want to see, you know, that their engagement with you delivers some sort of change. And I think there's an incredible pressure on, uh, on, it, on NGOs in that, right? just because of how they're structured. And I do ask myself this big question, right, whether, you know, most NGOs were came in a period, right? They came like in the 60s, 70s. Whether that 40-year rule is, is, is accurate, that now actually the structure of NGOs needs to end and we need to move towards more, how do we build social movements? And I think that's a challenge, right? For, I see that as a, as a, as a big organizational challenge. There's something that, you know, uh, Friends of the Earth well, has as its motto uh, internationally. And, I, and I've always seen that as really, really important, the sort of, the resist, transform, mobilize, you know, how do we resist existing social injustices? But, you know, how do we also transform? How do we build those alternatives? And how do we, you know, mobilize people in terms of being able to build collective longer term power? And sometimes all of those compete against each other. And, and so you can say, yes, we need to do all of those, but uh, how do you prioritize and, and, and where do you prioritize? And uh, I suppose, uh, uh, say, uh, do you remember Gramsci? For those who, who, who stood up, study politics, of uh, you know, he famously said, you know, about pes pessimism of the intellect, but optimism of the will, right? And and maintaining that optimism of the will, uh, I think, in an organisation, is is very very hard. I mean, and I have to check myself. In fact, this week I was told off by my own one of my own staff members who said. Hold on a minute. I'm at, I'm at flat out, right? And we're responding again to, again to Gaza. How do I respond? Where do I find more time? And of course, that's really hard because your own supporters and members expect you to be doing now more, more, you know. And of course, when we face global injustices, it's really hard. And I, we have partners all around the world. And so I'm constantly, of course, get communication from our partners to say, we're in a life death situation. Uh, we need your support right now. We need to do something. How do you, how do you do that, right? How do you manage that when you've only got a few, you know, a small number of staff? And uh, so I think that idea of how are we building collective power? How do we recognise we are not the only solution? That actually working collaboratively with lots of other people is really important. And that takes a little bit of saying, okay, our brand shouldn't be, the, isn't the most important thing. Actually, putting ourselves forward isn't the most important thing. Maybe there are other people who can do this, but we can add something to them. And that's a real, I think that's a real dilemma and a challenge, and I'm not sure anybody's quite worked it out yet to be able to do it effectively. I mean, I think it's their visionary, but uh, it's, it's a challenge, and it's, I, I, it's one I'm trying to think through for my organization. What does that look like, and how can you transform an organization into a social movement? Thanks, Asad. Yep, naming some of those urgency of fun funding, trying to maintain brand, all of these things that are actual practical challenges for us. Um, Sophie? Can you repeat the question? Yep, sure. What do you see as the main challenges or obstacles to a more sustainable or regenerative approach, either individually or within your organisation? Yeah. Um, uh, one of the things that... Uh, uh, in transition, I was part of two organisations. So we had Transition Town Tot Ness, you know, that kind of took off and, and did really well. And one of the things that was fascinating there was that at the start, there was, you know, some people who were very, very action-oriented and some people who were very inner-oriented. And, and 
for me, that was a really unusual syn synthesis. I was the, one of the inner-oriented people, and actually to be able to come and serve a movement that was really about creating community scale change, but to bring insights around process um, felt incredibly satisfying. Um, and then I was part of Transition Network that was much more, much more action-driven. It was much more about projects, getting things done. And within that organisation, people who didn't have the kind of incredible stamina for that way of working started to burn out, including me. Um, so one of the things that I really saw, again, was this you know, bringing together of, of, of inner and outer, of process and task, um, and how split those are in our mainstream culture. You know, some people talk about, you know, the kind of the spiritual inner practice got separated off from science and technology. And like that whole way of thinking that they, you know, in healthy cultures, those things are inseparable. There's no separation from spirit in the material world, from our action and our heart. You know, it's like when those things start to divide, then we start to create, I think, unhealthy cultures and, um, yeah, and unhealthy and, and unsustainable and divisive practices. Um, and, and for me, another way of expressing that is really what you're saying. It's like we need to, to put relationship back at the center. Um, relationship to myself, relationship to others. How are we powerful together? Um, but, but within that is, uh, is the aspect of, uh, aspect of collaboration that I'd add to what G says, which is part of what we do for each other is we hold each other emotionally <coughs> when things are really challenging. And I think it's a really helpful insight about humans that if we don't have that sense of being held when we face the end of the minor strike and it didn't and we lost, you know, when we face COP15 and the movement, it's like if we don't have the holding to be able to process our feelings, actually our feelings run us in ways that are then really, really unhelpful. And I think one of the ways you can see the whole system of capitalism and colonialism is people who can't manage their own feelings of pain and despair shoving it out onto other people. And I think we can easily get into that in the environmental movement, that if we haven't, for instance, if we haven't digested our feeling of grief and rage about what's happening to the planet, we're going to write it in very, very depressing books and sell a million copies, and now a million people are feeling my despair and depression. You know, and, I, and I see that around, especially environmental movement, pervading the way that we've communicated often to, to increase people's level of fear and hopelessness, you know, as well as attempting to motivate a kind of response. So for me, there's something about understanding how much, as human beings, our, our capacity is kind of regulated by what we can bear to feel that is not in the mainstream view of what a human being is. In the mainstream, we're actors and we're rational, and if we have the logic and the facts, then we're going to do stuff. But actually, that's not my experience of how I work, and it's not how I've seen other groups work. So there's something about um, the relationship that also creates a, a holding, sustaining, nourishing field, you know, from which we come back to after the action and which, which regenerates us then to go out into the world feeling connected and energised and resourced and valued and empowered. Um, and that's the kind of state we need um, to act from and come back to. Thank you for, for naming this really important aspect of relationship and, and how the inner work is often sidelined in, in activist circles, but without it, we kind of, we do go adrift. And how do we recreate that space? Um, for me, some of the challenges that I see, I mean, in our organization and for myself included, is an organization is made up of individuals. And being a global organization, you have individuals around the world who are facing um, things to s different degrees. So I'm living in the UK, and a lot of the work that I do isn't actually affecting me on a day-to-day -day basis. Working on the war in Yemen, I see it on the news and I see it on the TV, but I'm not facing it every day. My colleague who's in Palestine, who's working in Palestine on, uh, as part of the resistance movement, that's not something that they are going home from. That's their every day. And how do you build an organization and a culture that um, equips people to deal with different situations around the world? Um, and I think another challenge for me is um, my identity. 
and being in a movement where there actually isn't a lot of people that look like me. Um, and there isn't a lot of people that necessarily have the shared experience uh, as I do, or who are, who face the same challenges around racism or Islamophobia um, as I do and how I bring that to the workspace and the baggage or the things that might trigger me that are different to other people that I work with. I think that's another challenge. Um, and it's a challenge that we can overcome by discussing it. But I, quite honestly, if there aren't people who look like me or who have that shared experience, that will continue to be a challenge. Because that is a burden that I then bear sharing it um, and trying to explain. And I think that's something that we need to work on in terms of diversity um, is, is a really important thing, I think, that will continue to be a challenge until um, we're able to face it. Um, and then another thing that I have found challenging is being able to verbalize these feelings. And we've talked about it a lot, right? Uh, having the language is super important. And I think early on, I had these feelings, but I couldn't communicate them in real time. I couldn't say, oh, like something isn't feeling right for me, or um, I disagree with this, and things would move so fast, and it would almost become repressive, where I'm like, oh, like I wanted to say something today. I didn't know what it was. And I think the exercise we did today, which is something we do at work now all the time, is state shifting. So we embedded state shifting in our working culture, where at the beginning of every call, the first five minutes are dedicated to state shifting. So everyone goes off, do what you need, check in with yourself. Or, am I feeling thirsty? Is there, I don't, maybe the heating's on too high. I haven't been outside today. Maybe my ergonomics uh, is sucking right now. Or maybe I just came off a call and I didn't, like like what I heard and I remember an instance last week where we were working on a campaign and our CEO came on the call and he said something that totally jarred me and threw me off the work that I was doing and then he jumped off the call and actually being able to say hey guys I need to state shift before we can carry on this call um, to other people sounds crazy because what I'm saying is he just came on the call I didn't like what he said and I need to like get a chance to get my shit together but because we've created that language and that exists in our culture, it's totally fine. OK, let's go off, do the state shifting. Um, and I think that's really important because it totally changes the dynamic in a group. And it's so important that whether you're a manager or someone who's been in a team a long time, to embody that culture and to um, show other people it's OK. So. For me, it's seeing a CEO or managers who are very, see work-life balance important and say, hey, it's 5.30, I need to go. Um, or I'm not feeling 100% today. I'm not sick, but I'm not feeling 100%. I'm going to take the day off. Or, hey, today I'm just not feeling it. I have no inspiration. I just need some time to search for it. It's so important to other people because it empowers them to use that language and do the same thing when they need it. And I think that's a, a, another positive thing that I, I know that we do and that I've learned from. And now that when we have new people in the team, that I can be like, hey, you know, I just, if you're tired today or you just need some time to connect with the campaign we're doing, take it. It's super important that you spend the two hours finding your solid ground on the campaign because. This is a long term, right? It's something that we're going to be doing for a really long time. And taking the time to connect with it is so important. And the process of developing the campaign and feeling engaged as an individual is important to the, the wider organization, but also the wider movement. Um, so that's just a couple of reflections that I had. Wow, that sounds like an amazing practice actually within the organization to recognize you're a whole individual and that's a really powerful point that you are a person with feelings and, and not just a kind of robot mm. uh, implementing campaigns and the need to bring your whole self if your experience is not the same as other people and if particularly if they're, they're aspects that, you know, diversity related aspects in terms of what, what you're able to bring and what other people have experienced themselves. So I think there's really powerful points. Um, and the point, of course, about people being in different experiences in different parts of the world and that sort of catching thing of someone experiencing that, but you're not able to help them if you're not in that situation okay. and trying to, there's, you know, that question of what can you really do to support that? <coughs> what is the real thing you can do? Um, so for the final question, Sophie, I'll start with you. Um, and we've, we have touched on this a little bit, um, which is how are you trying to meet these challenges? Um, both individually and organizationally, and what can we do to build a more sustainable practice? So you could take the bigger view 
or the organisational view or the individual view? Um, so personally, uh, in transition, I realised at some point that I still wasn't sustainable. Um, I had a lot of support systems around me, but I, uh, I actually had a physical injury and I realised that I wasn't recovering from it fully while I was still working. So I stepped out of transition in 2016. So, you know, part of my own personal thing has been to take time out to recover and it's been a long recovery um, uh, to come back. Uh, and, you know, th this is my rhythm, so it's not been an annual rhythm, but it's a longer rhythm. But I can feel the regeneration happening in me to, to have another kind of arc outwards. Uh, and I, th I mean, I think the processes that you're describing, Fatima, are just fantastic. You know, that we catch, you know, that we have a culture that, that understands that we step out of how are we and we ask. We, we're able to step out of just being caught by our state, by our feelings, because it's usually the emotions, even if we notice the thoughts. We can step out and say, am I in a fit state, you know, to make a good contribution? And are we in a fit state to make a good, a good meeting together? And if not, what do we need to do to take care of that? Um, we didn't quite get to it in transition. We, we put some structures in place, so we would always start a meeting with a check-in and silence. Um, we would appoint a keeper of the heart for every meeting, so that if there was something, if the vibe start, started to go pear-shaped, somebody would notice, or if people were getting tired, or something was tightening, you know, we would uh, have somebody whose role it was, but anybody could stop the meeting and go, hold on a minute. Um, and we would have a check out at the end where we would reflect, you know, how did that meeting go and what do we want to do better next time. We, we actually, th this tension of doing and being got so strong in the, at the centre of transition, we, it ended up in a conflict that we had external facilitation for. Um, and as a result of that, we said we were going to really focus on balance, you know, between action and reflection um, as part of our organisational kind of script. Um, so yeah, th those are some of the patterns at, at the start of Transition Town to Ness. We, in our second meeting, so just when the, the wave of excitement about transition was really birthing, the second meeting, so a group that had only come together one time before, we did a burnout check. We said, how sustainable is everybody in this group? We were all volunteers. Uh, can you keep going at this level? Is how, what are you giving? What are you getting? What's your sort of depletion rate? People said not more than six months. So we took a, a strategic decision in that meeting that we had to either scale down to be sustainable within what we were, the energy we were putting in, or we had to get some paid support, you know, that we couldn't. And for me, that was the, that was the most important decision we ever made in Transition Town Top Nest. There's been very little burnout in that project. Um, and it's still going on extremely little resource, you know, many, many years later. Uh, we put in structures of support for the key activists, so we got people to offer free mentoring, one-to-one -one mentoring. Um, and I think that layer of support that's outside of the system itself is another really, really important pattern. So, you know, I was a therapist at some point, so there you understand that if you're working with a very unconscious system, you need someone to help when you start picking up the unconscious patterns of the person you're working with. But if you imagine that an organisation working with war or violence or people that are recovering from sexual abuse, it's like the frontline workers are in, in contact not just with one person, but a whole system's trauma. Who's standing behind them helping them when you know, they put the health into that system, but the trauma comes back into the frontline workers? And that happens everywhere. And for me, we need a pattern that goes behind the frontline workers, our spaces for debrief, for sharing the, you know, what the pain is that you're seeing and processing it, for coming back to, to shift state back out of being caught in that to a place where you're grounded and resourced and connected again. So for me, there are, there are patterns that we need to weave in. We get in a time warning. It's very hard on a panel, <laughs> isn't it, when you've all got something to say. Sorry, I'm so I was supposed to be keeping an eye, but I'm so engrossed in what you're all saying. Yeah, like everyone, <laughs> like everyone else. <laughs> had to lift Christabel, too, to not really catch my attention. Um, so uh, we'll go back now to Fatima and then Asad. I'm sorry, we're not probably not going to have time for, for questions, oh. but if you're able to, uh, you're, you're all around in the break. So yeah. yeah, if anyone would like to have private chats, that'd be great. Um, 
I'm getting my mic fixed if you want to repeat the question for me. <laughs> sure, that's fine. Um, how are you plan to meet the challenges? So we touched on it a little bit. Yeah. Um, it could be organisationally or in terms of the wider movement or individually. Yeah. Um, how are we trying to deal with it? I think it's recognizing that this is something that's in flux constantly. There's like a recalibration that needs to happen. Um, and the thing that I notice in myself, and I think it applies to most activists, is that we're all born with guilt as a default, right? <laughs> and then comes with it is shame sometimes. Um, and it's trying to overcome that guilt and shame is what is the key to sort of unlocking a lot of this and the ways that i the things that i'm working on right now but uh the tools that i'm using is um mission is the metric so that's something that we use at work but i've applied it to my own life which is i think work-life balance is a very fake term because it insinuates that there's work and there's life and that there's a balance or that you should be achieving a balance all the time and that isn't the case if you sort of see your life as the mission, or the mission, and then life, work, other things, like are just totally in there. And at different points, you will have different levels of balance. Sometimes your kids or your partner will require a lot more energy or, or time or, or attention than your work or your activism, and that's totally fine. And I think once you realize that there, it's it, it's not real that you're going to find a 50% 50, 50 balance. The guilt and shame starts the ebb away. Um, so that's one of the things that I'm working on is that there's going to be times that, you know, I'm giving 30% to my activism and I'm giving, you know, the other 70% to other things in my life. And that's totally fine. Um, the state shifting is something I do so much more often. It isn't just something that calls, but just checking in all the time what is that anxiety i'm feeling what is going i'm playing with my mic i can feel it <laughs> um, uh, what is that anxiety i'm feeling today and trying to identify it and then trying to red remedy it um, and then the other thing is accept welcome dance so there's things going on in the world all the time that we can't control and it's the the practice or the meditation is the accepting it and then welcoming the opportunity or the challenge. And then the dancing is the, the movement between the accepting and the welcoming. It's not a constant thing. You have to kind of re-accept, you have to welcome it, and then see you know, how that figures in your life. Um, so whether that's something that's a challenge in the world, whether it's the Trump election or Brexit, or if it's you know, a difficult relationship, it's the accepting, it's the welcoming and the dancing. And then the last thing is just as I was coming here, I pinged my one of my colleagues who is in Ramallah in Palestine, being like, hey, you know, I'm going to this thing. It'd be like, how do you, what does regenerative um, activism mean to you? How do you sustain your energy? And he was like, oh, I don't have time, but victory is a really important thing. And then I was like, ah, oh, this makes sense to me, because I remember writing an email to my friends um, after a major campaign arc, and sending them an email um, with the Nelson Mandela quote um, where he talks about uh, having reached a vista and taking a short while to, to enjoy the vista, right? And that's so important to me and something I'm integrating into my life where I'm not constantly running towards the next battle and then reaching defeat and then running to the next battle, but actually enjoying victories, like celebrating is such an important part to resistance. And I love what was said earlier about, you know, joy being part of resistance. It's so, yeah, that's a big thing. It gives you, it's like the refueling. The top, when you get to, you know, a plateau in the mountain, stopping there and gazing back and then refueling and moving on, I think is such an important uh, uh, thing that's a, been a gift to me to realize, but I, I hope I can offer up. Beautiful, thank you. Uh, I feel like I want to also <laughs> respond to a few things. Uh, 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 Gita knows this. I've, I mean, spent 10 years at Friends of the Earth. I, I, I always used to say, I still I suppose do, say, I'm a reluctant environmentalist. Uh, uh, I came to environmentalism because I believe in justice and people, not because I believe in environmentalism. And, and I, I have to say, I, for a long time, I had a lot of anger about the environment movement. You know, I would see uh, largely white NGOs, white people mediating climate change which didn't really affect them in the same way as people in the global south and making compromises on behalf. Um, and I saw as willing to sacrifice people in the global south because of a number of considerations, usually organizational, not principle, not science, none of those things. And uh, uh, 
And they always used to strike me, bloody that white polar bear on the wire. Not against polar bears, <laughs> I'll tell you that. But, you know, why was that the bloody climate change, right? I mean, how do you de depoliticize something and take our, take our people and our communities out of this conversation? And uh, um, so and then I, I've got to say, I, I came across younger activists who were talking about decolonizing the movement, decolonizing the environment. I was like, yes, that's actually what we, what we need to do and what we're doing. So I say, but on an individual level, I, I, have, I, I am learning so much more from uh, a new generation of activists, radical activists who, who are doing a much better job at pulling this, the inner and the outer to together. And, uh, and I'm trying to learn and then trying to think about how do you bring that to, the, to my organization and to my work. And, but also recognizing the real, there are also things that maybe we can bring, you know, some of the, some of the fights and the history of struggle that we've been through and some of the lessons, right? I mean, at the moment, people talk about, you know, identity, you know, and, and you know, there was a moment in the 80s where we also had what was quote unquote identity politics, but it pitted people against each other rather than try to build a collective identity. So how do you build that race, class, gender, sexuality, et cetera, alliance together rather than trying to speak about people specific and of course you recognize that every community and every people have a specific uh, sort of frame and experience and you have to value that, but also what is the we we're trying to build in that. Um, and so in, uh, bring it to the organization, I mean, one of the first things I'm trying to do, and I've, I've only just recently started to war on once is, is yeah, yeah, we've got a strategic framework about what we're doing, and we have incredible outputs and exhausting outputs. But I'm also trying to think about, you know, more, how, you know, what we're doing about our, you know, uh, how do we build that sort of collective vision, and, and what is the culture that we need to have both internally and out externally, and then what are the right processes, and, and what can you bring in from other spaces to make sure that we sustain.